Okay, brethren, I think you'll know that fairly soon uh, we're coming up to, to Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover is uh, two weeks tomorrow night. It's Sunday evening, the 21st day of April. So you need to make sure that's on your calendar. And day later, we have the night to be much remembered on the Monday evening. And then on the Tuesday, it is the first holy day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And at that time, we'll have services on, on that feast day. Now, most of us, I would imagine, can be very, very busy uh, with life, tasks, jobs to do, uh, distracted by a million different things. So it's not always easy, necessarily. Uh, I think it's dangerous to just casually turn up at Passover evening to take Passover, because between now and then, you will be distracted. Things will happen. Uh, you'll lose your way a little bit, right? And that's, that's hazardous because what we don't want to do is just turn up on Passover evening to take Passover without preparing ahead of time. And today's message and next week's as well is about preparing adequately so that we take Passover in a right spirit, in a right mind, a right attitude, not being careless or neglectful because, as we'll see in a moment, there is a warning in Scripture about taking Passover in an unworthy manner and what that might mean for an individual that, that does that. So let's open our Bibles first of all at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll read verses 23 to 30. So 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 and verse, verse 23, here we read, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And Paul says here, he received this directly from Jesus Christ by revelation. He didn't pick this story up from Matthew or the Apostle John who had been there. It says, I received this from the Lord. It's straight from Jesus' mouth. Verse 24, and when he, Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus is instituting the, the New Testament emblems of the Passover, uh, the bread and the wine, as opposed to the, uh, the lamb's body and, and the blood of the lamb. Verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. This do, do this, in remembrance of Jesus. That's the story that, that Paul picked up from the Lord Jesus. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of wine, you proclaim the Lord's death, Till he comes, it's a memorial, a remembrance of Jesus' death, which is why it's you know, very, very solemn. You're actually picturing uh, the death of the Lord Jesus, which, of course, was a very painful and humiliating death uh, on a cross. But that's the background to, to the event. That's the background to what we do. We take the bread and the wine, as Jesus laid out there for us, and said, do this. In remembrance of me, but notice verses 27 through 30. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, you and I don't want to be guilty of, if you like, mishandling you know, Jesus' uh, body and blood of treating it in some way casually or neglectfully. That wouldn't be good, would it? We don't want to do that. So what do we do? Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine yourselves and then eat the bread and drink the cup. Examine yourselves first. Examine yourself. Then you'll be better equipped to take the bread and the wine in a worthy manner. Verse 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or have died. Prematurely. Obviously died prematurely. <laughs> Everybody dies at some point. But for Paul to, to put this warning here, he says, look, because some of you, some of us, have taken the bread and the wine in an unworthy manner, we have brought damnation or judgment on ourselves. For that reason, many are sick, unwell, and some even have died before their time, prematurely, because they took the Passover wrongly in an unworthy manner. So that's, that's quite a warning. And what you and I don't want to do, of course, is turn up in two weeks' time and take the Passover in an unworthy manner. You know, Passover is very important if you're a Christian, very important. It commemorates the death of the Lord Jesus. It's very solemn. Take it in an un unworthy manner, you might be in trouble, right? Now, of course, many of us have kept Passover perhaps for years, for decades. There's always a slight risk that uh, it might get a bit sort of uh, so familiar. We know that familiarity breeds contempt. So it's so familiar, we sort of treat it casually, easy come, easy go. That's not the way to approach Passover. That's not the way we approach the memorial of the death of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, right? So we want to approach it in a, in a, in a sort of mood or an attitude of respect and, and reverence. Also, I tend to think, my personal view, uh, as we approach this time of year, it helps us to perhaps redress the balance. Now, some people have said, I don't entirely agree with them, but I know where they're coming from. Some people have said that the churches of God, from my sort of background, um, they don't use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as, as often as, as they should. People say, well, you know, these Protestant churches out there, the evangelical churches out there, they're always talking about Jesus this and Jesus this and Jesus that, and so on and so forth, singing songs to Jesus. But you in the churches of God, you spend all your time, this is the allegation, in the Old Testament, reading the words of Moses, reading about the law, and you don't spend enough time talking about the Lord Jesus. I don't think that's accurate, but I can see why some people might come to that conclusion. But if that were the case, then at this time of the year, as we head into the spring holidays, it's all about the Lord Jesus. So here's a great opportunity for us, if there was a problem, to make sure that we focus on the Lord Jesus, think about the Lord Jesus, talk about the Lord Jesus, because he is the center of the Passover season, right? Let's look at first, we're in First Corinthians, let's look at chapter 5. So Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is the central part, the core of the Passover season. Chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. Now, earlier in the chapter, uh, Paul's brought out that he was not at all happy with the people in Corinth, the church, especially its leaders, I guess, because they had public sin, public immorality. Right? A man was living with his father's uh, wife, and rather than sort of excommunicating that man, uh, the church was apparently being very tolerant, showing their love and tolerance inclusiveness, right, to this public sinner. And Paul's aghast, right? So you pick up a story in verse 6. Uh, your glorying about that situation is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, <coughs> purge out or clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. Notice References here to leaven, 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 unleavened. Gives you a hint of what the rest of the passage is about. For indeed, carrying on, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Which feast? Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So a couple of takeaways here. Christ, Jesus, is our Passover. That's what Paul says. Jesus Christ is our Passover. And what was the Passover all about? We'll look in a moment. But Jesus Christ is our Passover. Sacrifice for you and for me. 
And therefore, that being the case, let us keep the feast. Which feast? Oh, which feast do we associate with leaven and unleavened? Oh, the feast of unleavened bread, of course. Jesus' Passover, therefore keep the feast, right? Not the feast of Easter, right? But the feast of unleavened bread. So I think to understand uh, the Passover and Jesus as our Passover, it's helpful to just refresh our understanding of that first original Passover and what we can learn from it. So you may not have been to these scriptures for maybe a year or so. Um, or maybe you read them more often than that. But I'll assume that for some people, they've not looked in these areas for perhaps the best part of a year since last Passover. So let's go to Exodus chapter 11, pick up the story of that first Passover. And the Passover is important because Jesus is our Passover. Well, what does that mean? What does that suggest to us? So Exodus 11, let's read verses 4 through 7. <coughs> then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the animal, and all the firstborn of the animals. Right? Verse 6. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But, verse 7, against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So here's God talking about the tenth plague on Egypt. You know, Israel has been in slavery for quite a while. God's about to deliver them, to rescue them, and to take them off towards the promised land, right? And the tenth plague is the one that will finally tip over stubborn Pharaoh, which is the death of the firstborn, whether it's royalty, whether it's the poor people, the animals, all the firstborn in Egypt are going to be slain, but not those among the Israelites. And yet, it's not going to be automatic. <clears throat> the uh, Israelites will be protected if they do something. They have a part to play, right? Let's pick up the story there in Exodus chapter 12 and verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> That's going to be 1 through about 13, I think, in total. <clears throat> but starting in verses 1 to 5, the story of that first Passover. <clears throat> now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb, your Passover lamb, as you'll see, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So we're talking about a lamb, the Passover lamb. Now, of course, we've been through this before many times. We know the symbolism. It's talking about the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God, right? We know that. But notice, it's a lamb. It's a male lamb because what it points to. And the lamb must be without blemish. Again, because we know to whom it points. And this is the central part of the Passover, the lamb. It's the centre, right? And of course, Jesus is the Lamb of God, the centre of the Passover for you and me. Let's pick up in verse 6. <clears throat> now you shall keep the Lamb until the 14th day of the same month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Or in Hebrew, between the two evenings. Twilight, right? Dusk. So that would, the two evenings would be when the sun sets and the 14th starts. God's day starts in evening time, not 
middle of the night or not dusk, not dawn, but at sunset. So as the sun sets, that looks like the first evening, and then maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour later, depending on where you are, it's dark. That'll be the second evening. So in that gap of about 30, 40, 50 minutes, whatever, is when you kill uh, the lamb. You slay the lamb at twilight, as the New King James says there. Verse 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Right, so splash the blood on your doorposts because it's going to be a, a visible sign. Because we'll see in a few moments, God's going to go through the land uh, with a destroying angel of some sort. And if he sees the blood that you've painted on, he will pass over your home, not kill the firstborn. If there's no blood there, because you didn't obey, <laughs> you didn't you know, do your bit, then any firstborn in that house would, would die. <clears throat> Verse 8. Then they shall eat the flesh of the lamb on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Don't eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. That'll be about dawn. And what remains until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it. So you don't just take the blood, you know, paint it on your doors and then throw the lamb's body into the bin or something. You, you, you eat it. It's important, as we'll see more next week. Thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now it says eat it in haste. Uh, I've said before, there's a, it doesn't make a lot of sense that the, uh, another uh, English translation for the Hebrew, eat it in trepidation, in some concern. Because <laughs> if you got it wrong, right, if you didn't cooperate with the instructions properly, then any firstborn in that house isn't going to make it. So probably eat it in trepidation is a better translation. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, the night of the 14th, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Right? So it's important. The blood is a sign. And it's a sign that you'll be delivered, passed over. And of course, the thing we know that Jesus Christ's blood is a sign for us. All right? So quite important. But notice, just in passing, there are two parts. The blood and the body of the Lamb. It's not just one. It's not just the blood and that's the whole story. You paint the blood around your door and you roast and eat the lamb, the lamb's body. <clears throat> if you look at uh, Exodus 12, reading verses 21 to 27. <clears throat> then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that's in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Stay in all through the night until roughly dawn, which I think at that time of the year in Egypt was about 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 a.m., right? On the 14th, this is all happening on the 14th. God passed over on the 14th in the middle of the night sometime. Verse 23, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you, or to strike the firstborn at least. I guess a destroying angel of some sort. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land 
which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by the service? that you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. So that's the background to the first Passover. The lamb is obviously central, absolutely key to the event. But let's look at uh, Numbers 28. Just pick up another point that's quite relevant. Numbers 28. I'm going to read verses uh, 16 and 17. <clears throat> On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And on the 15th day of this month is the feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. So on the 14th is a Passover, on the 15th is a feast. The two separate occasions, two separate uh, moedim, two separate appointed times. The Passover is the 14th, the feast is the 15th. We read in 1 Corinthians 5 there, Christ is our Passover, therefore let us keep the feast. That's how it works. The 14th is the Passover, the 15th is the feast. <coughs> Now, the 14th day is called the Passover, right? It's not called the Passover because you kill a lamb on the 14th and then eat it on the 15th. This is what the Jews always did, still do today. You know, a, a standard Jewish seder, their Passover meal, they keep on the 15th of the first month. They do nothing today on the 14th at all. And they always claimed, or some people claim, well, you know, the Passover lamb was killed late on the 14th and then roasted and eaten on the 15th. So everything's in the 15th. No, it's not. Never was. Right? The 14th is the Passover. Why is it called the Passover, do you think? Right? Clue. Because God passed over. That's why it's called the Passover. Right? It's not called the Passover because you kill a lamb. I mean, they kill lambs every day of the week, probably. Right? because that's what they would have eaten, you know, quite a lot of. So killing a lamb is not, not the Passover. God passing over is the Passover. And the 14th is the Passover. That's the day when God passed over. And then the 15th, you know, they left. We'll cover that another time. So two separate events, one day apart. Although today and for probably the best part of 2,000 years, the Jews do all in one day because that's what the Jews do. They always rejected God. If you remember, House of Israel into captivity, House of Judah into captivity, um, even though God sent prophet after prophet, seer after seer, rising up early and sending them, they always rejected God's prophets, rejected God and his word, and went into captivity for centuries, right? So they always reject God's word. And we saw, I think, quite recently, we were reading about the law and the testimony that uh, Jesus said in his day as he walked on the earth, you know, you make the word of God of none effect by your traditions. That's one of the traditions. Now here's a quotation from the Encyclopedia Judaica about the fact these were originally separate. So that's Encyclopedia Judaica, that's the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Feast of Passover consists of two parts. Not today, it doesn't. The Passover ceremony and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover ceremony and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Originally, both parts existed separately. <laughs> but at the beginning of the exile, they were combined. The exiles when Nebuchadnezzar took them all off right, to captivity in Babylon. That's the exile. So up to that point in time, they admit they were separate. Passover 14th, Feast 15th. But somewhere around about then, merged, right? Silly, really. Just follow the word of God. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, because as we've said already, a lamb is absolutely central to Passover. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Let's have a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> And we're going to read verses 17 to 21. 
First Peter chapter 1, try again. Verse 17 through 21. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning, your stay here on earth in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, delivered or set free with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But this is how you were redeemed. How you were redeemed, how I was redeemed. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it's harking back to Exodus 12. Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, is the, is the lamb without blemish, without spot sinless, completely innocent, and it's through his shed blood that you and I are redeemed. That's pretty much what the Passover lamb of the Old Testament was. Ancient Israel were redeemed, delivered from the death penalty of the destroying angel by the blood of the lamb, a lamb without blemish, right? Just carrying on and finishing the thought. He indeed, verse 20, was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's just before the flood. Remember, foundation of the world is not creation. Foundation of the world is the flood. He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So the precious blood of a lamb. I mean, Jesus as a lamb of God is, is key. Absolutely key. Um, Let's have a look at John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, and chapter 1. <clears throat> so we can think of Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, I guess we typically do. Uh, but also he's the Lamb. He's the Lamb of God. That's one of his titles, an important title for important reasons. So looking at uh, John 1, verses 29 to 31. The next day, John, John Baptist, in this particular case, Jesus had been baptized in the River Jordan about 40 days earlier, according to my inspired marginal notes. The next day, John Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And thank God he does. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Right? So Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at verses 35 to 36. Again, the next day, the following day, John Baptist stood with two of his disciples, which was John and Andrew. And he, looking at Jesus as he walked, said, Behold the Lamb of God. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's his title, right? It's an important title because obviously it, it features in part of Jesus' mission. He is the Lamb of God. He was sent as a lamb to be slain for you and for me. Now, he's called the Lamb of God uh, over 25 times in the book of Revelation. So that's quite a lot, really, if you think about it. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb. 25 times, more than 25 times. Just look at a couple. Try Revelation 5 and verses 8 to 10. So you'll find it in lots and lots of places in the book of Revelation. That's the final book of the Bible. Uh, Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 8 to 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, or it's apparently the Greek says lambkin, little lamb. <laughs> One of our ministers once made a big deal of that, pointing out lambkin, little lamb, lambkin, little lamb, little innocent lamb. Right, of course, the Passover lamb, if you think about it, was of the first year, and probably quite early in the first year because of the timing of, of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So very little lamb, a lambkin. Now, when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, the lambkin, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, uh, saying, 
You are worthy to take this scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. This is the Lamb who shed his blood to redeem us. One of Jesus' titles. Look at uh, verses, no, chapter 7, I think. We turn to chapter 7, verses uh, 9 to 10. And then 13 to 15. So Revelation 7, 9 to 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The throne of God the Father and before the Lamb, the Lambkin, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to the Father and the Lord Jesus. They give it and share it to whomever they wish. But this comes from the Lamb and the Father. Verses 13 to 15. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? I said, Well, sir, you know, because I'm sure I don't. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Where therefore... They are before him, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits in the throne will dwell among them. So Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God and we're washed in his blood, right? Now it's not surprising in a sense that the Passover occupies quite a large portion of the four Gospels. In fact, uh, the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, about half the Gospel Right? Occupies Jesus' final Passover. And the others, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a fair chunk of those Gospels which talk about Jesus' final Passover because Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is our Passover sacrifice. His coming to that point where he's sacrificed as our Passover is important. So each of the Gospels covers it. The Gospel of John in particular, you know, but 22 chapters long, half the book of John is about Jesus' final Passover. So let's have a look at some of those passages. Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses uh, 17 to 20 to start with. Matthew 26. Verses 17 to 20. <clears throat> now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, which is complete nonsense, it's not the first day of the feast. The New King James is what I'm reading, and the words there, day of the feast, are in italics. Meaning, meaning they were put in there by the translators to try and make sense of it. They don't make sense of it, they just confuse because it's not the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the first day of Unleavened Bread. Been through that before. Now, in the first day of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And, of course, Passover is one day, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, starts the day after. We saw that in Numbers 28. The Encyclopedia Judaica confirms that. Two separate things. So they haven't yet eaten the Passover. It can't therefore be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Translators, I think what happened with the translators is they're, they're good guys, very good at Hebrew and Greek and all the rest of it, but they don't keep the Holy Days themselves. They keep Christmas and Easter. So they don't actually understand how the Holy Days work. And you and I do. We know Passover is one day and the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes a day later, a day following. We've got that. We, we do it. We understand it. These guys don't quite see that level of accuracy. But notice there, where do you want us to prepare for you, Jesus, to eat the Passover? It sounds like Jesus is going to eat the Passover. right? And he said, Go into the city of Jerusalem to a certain man and say to him, 
The teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, Jesus sat down with the twelve, obviously to keep the Passover that had just been prepared, right? Now, I, I tend to belabor that a little bit because there's quite a lot of uh, Christians, believers, Church of God groups who say that Jesus did not keep the Passover, right? Because he was dead by the time Passover time arrived, right? So I'm just pointing out here that the disciples said, where do you want us to prepare the Passover? Jesus said, tell the, the, the man, I will keep the Passover at your house. It says they prepared the Passover. <laughs> Tables, cushions, right? Uh, the, the, the meat, the unleavened bread, right? And then Jesus came in with the twelve and sat down. Well, in context, presumably he sat down to eat the Passover, which he said he was going to eat in this house. So... I know people have got their verses, and the interpretations of the Greek and the Hebrew and the Irish, but there's no way that Jesus was lying here. He intended to keep the Passover and he kept the Passover. Let's look at verses uh, 26 to 30. Because during the Passover meal, Jesus introduced, if you like, the new symbols of the Passover. Right? In those days up to then, it was a uh, roast lamb. Of course, the original one, blood over the doors as well. And as they were eating, verse 26, the Passover, <clears throat> Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is, or oh, this picture, so this represents my body. So you get bread, breaks it, passes it around. This bread represents my body. Then he took the cup of wine and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is or represents my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus' blood, part of you know, our being forgiven for our sins. And he says it's the blood of the new covenant. Covenant is a, an agreement, right? a treaty. And you and I are in a special relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus that new covenant sealed in blood, right? But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus was, of course, subsequently arrested and taken off to be crucified. So that's uh, Matthew's quick summary of the Passover, that final Passover that Jesus kept. And during that Passover meal, which Jesus ate with his disciples, he introduced, you know, the, the bread and the wine, picturing his body and his blood. So in the Old Testament, we have the, the lamb and his blood and his body. In the New Testament, we have the lamb of God and his blood and his body, the wine and the bread. Right? So the Symbology continues. Have a look at Mark chapter 14. Because Mark covers that final Passover as well. Obviously so. It's key critical. Without the Passover, you and I have no future. <laughs> so it's rather relevant, isn't it? If you don't keep the Passover, as we'll see later, potentially you're in some serious trouble. And if you keep the Passover in an unworthy manner, you're in serious trouble. So keeping the Passover is important. And keeping it correctly is important. So Matthew, Mark chapter 14 and verses 12 to 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, not the feast. Feast day comes after the Passover, not before it. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, and actually other translations bring out they were actually killing the lamb at that moment. For example, uh, Young's literal translation says, when they were killing the Passover lamb at that time. Or the New American Standard Bible, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed at that moment. Right? Not 24 hours later, when the priests did it at the temple. 
verse 12 again. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when, the, when they killed or were killing the Passover lamb, his disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover, which he ate? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city of Jerusalem and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples, where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? A guest room, probably a reasonable sized room, right? Um, and again, I'm just laboring the point that Jesus said he would eat the Passover. And the apostles went and prepared the Passover, right? <laughs> that happened. Verse 15, then he will show you a large uh, upper room furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover, which you'd have to eat, I think, pretty quickly, right? You don't prepare the Passover and wait 10 days, right? <laughs> prepare the Passover, it means, you know, roast the lamb. Verse 17, in the evening he came with the twelve. And then they sat down and ate the Passover, right? Like, look at verses 22 to 26. And as they were eating the Passover, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Well, that's quite important, right? It doesn't mean actual Jesus' body. That's what the Catholics imagine with their doctrine of transubstantiation but it's symbolic, right? But Jesus says, eat this, guys. This picture is my body. You need to eat it, right? Because there's a lesson there for you. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is, this represents the blood of the new covenant, our special relationship, right? It's going to cost me my life, which is shed for many, Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Right. So it appears that Jesus has here modified the emblems of the Passover. The original was the lamb, its blood and body. Jesus is now saying, this is what you do going forward. Bread representing my body. And wine representing my blood, because I am the Lamb of God. And these are the elements, the emblems of the Lamb of God that you are to keep and do this. Right? When it's appropriate. See that in a moment. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's reread that in the light of what we've just been looking at. 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> Verses 23 to 26 to start with. <clears throat> Verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, it was night time, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, a lot of modern translations don't include the, the phrase broken for you, but it's in the original Greek as far as one can tell. So I think that's correct. Take eight. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When you do it, think of me. When you do it, reflect on me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That's why it's solemn, the Passover evening, because we are commemorating or uh, memorializing the death of the Lord Jesus till he comes. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
you're rehearsing the Lord's death. You're remembering the Lord's death. Well, that, that was a very sad moment. I mean, good in a sense, because it makes our forgiveness possible and so on. Right? It gives us the opportunity to head towards eternal life. But obviously, a pretty sad occasion that Jesus would have to you know, be killed uh, for your sake and for my sake. Now, it says in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, that doesn't mean as often as you feel like it. <laughs> it's a memorial, right? I mean, the Catholics, they, they go through all of this every Mass. It's called the sacrifice of the Mass in full. And every Mass, which can be multiple times a day, certainly every day of the week, several times on a Sunday, right? So they say, oh, as often as you eat, well, it's as often as we want, which is every day of the week and sometimes several times in a day. Well, really? Is that what that means? And of course, um, some of the Adventists, they keep, they call it the Lord's Supper. I don't think it's an accurate expression. But they say, oh, well, uh, four times a year. Well, where'd that come from? I don't know, right? There's probably a reason somewhere, but I can't think what it might be. Four times a year. And, and many Protestant churches, sometimes it's the first Sunday of each month, or it's the last Sunday of each month. It's a memorial, right? How, how often... How many Thanksgivings do you Americans keep every year, right? Oh. How many Independence Days do you Americans keep every year? How many times in the year do you keep Easter? <laughs> well, once, right? It's a memorial. The net translation, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death every time you do it. You do it on the day, on the night, as Paul says there. Well, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and wine and said, do this. That's what we do, right? Annually, on the memorial of Jesus' death, on the 14th day of the first month. Let's read verses 27 to 30. <clears throat> Therefore, you're picturing the death of the Lord Jesus. It's quite important, right? I mean, Jesus had been God forever. And he empties himself of his, of his divine Godhead. His, you know, the word is made flesh. He dwells on the earth. Uh, he gets rejected by certainly the religious, religious, religious leaders of the day. He, he gets arrested and denied justice and gets whipped, scourged and nailed to a cross or a stake and dies and gets buried, right? He who had been God, right, is now buried in a tomb. That's quite costly, right? Why did he do that? Well, out of love for the people, right? So it's important when we commemorate the, the death of Jesus, it includes everything that leads up to that, emptying himself of his Godhead to become human, physical, and then get killed, and then buried. And his death was a humiliating death because the crucifixion, uh, a lot of people were crucified, but it was reserved for the worst criminals. You know, there were quicker ways and more humane ways of killing people, stoning and and uh, chopping your head off and so on. But crucifixion was for the worst type of disgusting, evil, wicked criminals. So Jesus' death was a humiliating death as well as a painful one, right? Because of that, we can't afford to to keep the memorial casually or who cares, or can't be bothered. Let's read on. Therefore, since what we're doing is a memorial of Jesus' death, therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And we don't want to be there. But let a man examine himself and so afterwards implied, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So examine ourselves, right? The... Um, Amplified translation says, let a man thoroughly examine himself and only when he has done so should he eat the bread and drink of the cup. Let a man or woman thoroughly examine himself and only when he's done that, because you don't want to take it unworthily, right? So you, need, you and I need to examine ourselves and that we've got two weeks yet, two weeks tomorrow night before Passover arrives. In that time, we'll be distracted, as I said early on, we'll be quite busy with a ton of stuff on our minds. We have so many episodes of the Kim Kardashian show to watch, right? We'll be struggling to get time, but we need to get time to thoroughly examine ourselves. Do we understand what Passover is all about? Do we understand Jesus died for us? 
horribly and humiliatingly. Are we really grateful for that? Are we living in a way that's consistent with that understanding? Or is it easy come, easy go, I don't really care. I'll just turn up on the night and go with it. Well, better not, right? To carry on. Uh, verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, keeps Passover in other words, in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason... Taking the Passover in an unworthy manner, not having examined oneself. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Right? Not, not a good idea. Right? Now, Jesus brings out in, in uh, the Gospel of John a sort of um, a deeper meaning in some ways of his bread, uh, of the bread and the wine. So let's go there and have a look. John chapter 6, Gospel of John chapter 6. It's quite deep or profound, uh, so much so that uh, <laughs> the hearers in this time took exception and left Jesus, many of them. Many of Jesus' own disciples couldn't, couldn't accept what Jesus was teaching here, right? So they turned around and went away. Interesting, Jesus didn't chase after them and say, oh, hang on, guys, let me try and rephrase that for you. You turn away from Jesus, well, at least in this instance, Jesus just let them go. Interesting, but picking up in John 6, um, 25 to 35. John 6, 25 to 35. What had happened earlier in the chapter was Jesus had fed, I think, 5,000 men, probably women and children, with bread and fish, and they were quite excited to be fed. <laughs> well, it's not a bad idea, so they chased after Jesus the following day. Verse 25, and when they found Jesus on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Yeah, Jesus knew that we're after more food. Fill their bellies up. So it motivated them. Nice belly full of grub. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the work of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent, meaning himself. Therefore they said to Jesus, What sign will you perform then? that we may see it and believe you, because seeing is believing. <laughs> and the Jews, most of them at least, always want a sign. Can't believe anything unless they've got a sign, because they're carnally minded people, and were then and still are today. What work will you do? Our fathers, for example, at the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I don't know whether applying Jesus, we'd quite like you to, to do that and Perhaps give us 40 years of loaves and fishes <laughs> without working again, right? Because that's what they're pointing to, the days of Moses, when for 40 years the manna came, right? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, <coughs> Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Well, of course it wasn't Moses, it was God. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, well, great, give us this special bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread that produces life. I came from heaven. Of course, they're going to struggle with this, as we see in a few moments. They, they can't, can't understand it. They start to quarrel and argue and then a bunch of them leave Jesus and head off into the, to the horizon. Verses 41 to 58. Then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it, he says, I've come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, 
Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, fair enough, and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Because they're not going to grasp this. Jesus eat Jesus' bread but to eat Jesus' flesh. What's this crack put on about? The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Cannibalism? What is this? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, definitely, definitely, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Which, of course, the brains can't, can't accept that. They're very literal. Unless you eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What? 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 This can't make any sense. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father is at the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. All right? So that's quite profound in many ways. Eat Jesus' flesh, drink Jesus' blood, otherwise you have no life. All right? Now, of course, you know what it means to eat. We, we looked at the emblems of Jesus' flesh being bread, at Passover, Jesus' blood being the wine that we take at Passover. But when you look at the word eat, verse 53, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you've no life in you to eat. It's not just spectating at something. And the way I've discovered in the past is we don't just look at Jesus and say, oh, Jesus is admirable. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Look at Jesus over there. I admire Jesus. I worship Jesus. All right? That's not what you do with food. You don't just look at it. Well, you might briefly... Oh, look at that chocolate cake. Oh, look at that ice cream. Oh, look at that double cream. Right? But food is only of benefit if we eat it, if we consume it and digest it. It becomes part of us. So the thing that talks, Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, apart from the emblems that we keep at Passover, he's talking about it. We need to imbibe Jesus, let him be part of us. Right? Uh, we eat Jesus, we digest Jesus, and he becomes part of our body. Just as we eat, you know, you can look at a loaf of bread, and uh, perhaps a pat of butter on the table. You can look at it. Oh, it's lovely bread. Mm, smells wonderful. And the butter, oh, looks so creamy. And you look at it, look at it, look at it. Three weeks later, you're dead. Because looking at bread, looking at food, <laughs> doesn't do anything, right? Might make your mouth water for a while, but uh, unless you eat it, but if you eat it, you can live. We don't just look at Jesus and admire from a distance. You know, we have to sort of take his teachings and put them inside us. We're to walk with Jesus and live with Jesus, be in that special covenant with Jesus, which he sealed with his blood. <clears throat> and I think, as I've said before, that when we keep Passover, we take the bread, we take the wine. That's as close as we get, really, to eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. Very close symbol, right? Let's finally look at Hebrews chapter 10. So Jesus, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I think you could say, unless you keep Passover and eat the bread and drink the wine, you have no life in you. Okay, so let's look at Hebrews. So we don't want to take any of this uh, casually. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, reading verses 26 to 31. <clears throat> For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Sin willfully doesn't mean you stumble and fall, because we all do that. 
the sin will means you turn, you turn away, you're making a decision, that's enough. I'm not, not walking with Jesus any longer. I'm turning away, going in a different direction. That's to sin willfully. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Not a good outcome. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose? But worse than death, that's what it says. How much worse punishment than dying? How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant, which Jesus said this wine represents the blood of the new covenant, the wine that you'll take this do at Passover, has counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. But not do these things. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it most certainly is fearful. Don't take the bread and wine in an unworthy manner, right? Don't treat Jesus' blood and body uh, cheaply. So that's pretty much where we are today. We've got a couple of weeks to go until we keep Passover. <laughs> Let's be ready for Passover as it comes around. We've got two weeks. That gives us some time. Uh, it'll, it'll fly by. I mean, you'll be busy. Things will crop up. But you and I need to take some time, a little bit of time here and there, just to think about why we're keeping Passover and what Jesus means as our Passover and what Jesus means to us. Check our understanding and be ready to take Passover in two weeks' time in a worthy manner. And with that, we'll conclude today's Bible study.